Hello, and welcome to episode five of the Cathode Luminescence Explained webinar series. Today's topic is Cathode Luminescence Data Analysis. During this webinar, analysis of data drawn from various specimens shall be performed, the results discussed, and the benefits of such analysis demonstrated. At the conclusion of the webinar, you will be able to understand how to apply the demonstrated techniques to general specimens. Today's webinar will be presented by Dr. Jonathan Lee, Application Scientist for Cathaluminescence at Catan. His background includes the use of Time Resolve CL to characterize defect levels in gallium oxide to gain his doctorate from the University of Central Florida. He joined Gatan as an application scientist developing and demonstrating the capabilities of the newly released Monarch CL detector, the system that has been used to capture most of the data in this presentation. Before we begin, I'd like to encourage you to ask questions to the speaker throughout the webinar. Submit all questions through the questions pane. Issues regarding connectivity and webinar viewing will be addressed immediately. Questions for the speaker will be answered after the presentation. If there is insufficient time to answer all questions, answers will be provided by email response from one of the application team members at GATAN. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to you offline. More details of that at the end of the presentation. And with that, I will hand you over to Jonathan. Thank you, Parker, and welcome again, everyone, to Cathedral Luminescence Explained, Episode 5, uh, where today we're going to talk about uh, cathedral luminescence data analysis. Um, so <clears throat> throughout the presentation, I'll go over the CL experiment and the types of data that we're gathering. Uh, however, it would be in your interest if, if it's unclear how we're getting the data or how the experiment is taking place to review the earlier episodes um, from our website where we go into much more detail into the experimental technique. Um, so today we're going to describe what information can be learned from CL data and review the data analysis techniques for at least three different types uh, of data. Uh, one is the CL mapping, which is an intensity map, uh, spectroscopy or spectroscopic information where we look at spectra uh, from sample and angularly resolved information where we look at actually the angles that light leaves a sample surface. So cathodoluminescence, um, just to begin, is stimulated by an electron beam and acquired or collected into a, a detection unit. So this is a, a schematic of the electron or the SEM chamber with uh, the monarch unit and the collimating mirror inside the chamber. Um, so the way the experiment takes place is that we fire an electron beam into the sample and then we collect or actually the electron beam stimulates uh, several different processes inside of the material. Um, and so some of those include uh, X-rays, backscattered electrons, but in cathodal luminescence, we concern ourselves with the light that comes out. So um, the light that comes out is collected and then sent to a detector. And the most rudimentary CL experiment is a CL intensity mapping. And that's where we scan the electron beam and at the same time we acquire light images. So we're looking at, as a function of the excitation position, how much light is emitted from a sample. There's no wavelength information here. There's no color information here. This is just uh, a point detector that's responding to light striking it. Um, but as you can see in these two images, the secondary electron image versus the, the cathode luminescence image, there's very different information present in either one. So the way that we form a cathode luminescence map, again, is, is quite basic. Uh, basically, as we raster the beam, uh, we acquire the light that comes out of the sample, and then we form two images at the same time. So one would be the SEM image, and the other would be the, the CL image. So, so far, we've talked about um, unfiltered, which is only showing the intensity as a function of position. So this can be used in a bunch of different ways. So uh, one way that, uh, that I'd like to speak about is, so we can reveal revealing late rims in zircons for geochronology. So by acquiring all of the light that's emitted from the sample as we scan the beam across, we can see only the difference in intensity as a function of position. 
And what we see in this, uh, this sample uh, of zircon grains is that uh, the interior versus the exterior has uh, these rims or these uh, exterior surfaces that emit differently. And so if we couple this with a corollary technique such as uh, mass spectrometry, we can determine, uh, in this case, it was determined the isotope ratio of 206 lead and 238 uranium versus 207 lead and 235 uranium. So on the left axis, you're seeing one ratio, and on the x axis, you're seeing the other. And basically, by mass spectrometry, we can check at each of these points, one, two, three, two, eight, um, and determine what is the ratio of those isotopes. And that's basically giving us a lifetime uh, of those grains and, and when they were formed. So basically the outside of this grain was formed something like 420 million years ago, so in that ball. Whereas the inside of the grain was formed uh, about a billion years ago. So this is a great example of using something simple like the intensity uh, that comes from CL in order to determine um, the lifetime or the number of years since the formation of a, a grain like this. And that's just using uh, the intensity as a function of position. So one of the things that needs to be considered whenever um, designing an experiment is your spatial resolution that you need to achieve and that's controlled by the generation volume. So this is, uh, again, uh, I think this is a quartz grain where we're looking at 20 kV, and we can see a, a tremendous amount of blurring in this sample. However, when we reduce to 10 kV, you see a lot of that, a lot of those edges sharpen, and then further again at 5 kV. And what this is uh, telling us is that basically the generation volume that we're using to scan across the sample surface is limiting our resolution. So the smaller and smaller we make the generation volume, the higher we can uh, push our resolution. But of course, there's a limitation to it in that the lower generation volume you go, the fewer electron hole pairs that we can generate and the less light will come out of the sample. So there's a trade-off there. But what's important to note is that this is controlling um, the ultimate resolution of the data that you get out of it. So for instance, in this case, we can look at um, we can look at the rate that the blur goes across the edge. So if I take um, a profile, an intensity profile at each of these lines, uh, so about the same position across the sample uh, at different voltages, what you can see is that the edge of a feature is significantly rounded, right? So the slope of this line is uh, is increased at higher voltage. So as we go at a lower and lower voltage, uh, you can see um, we get closer and closer to uh, the generation volume no longer limiting um, the resolution of the image. And that actually gives us an opportunity to determine uh, the minority carrier diffusion length in a material, which is something that comes comes up frequently uh, when dealing with semiconductor materials. Um, so, one method that uh, that's been used historically for determining diffusion length in semiconductor materials is to look at uh, the CL intensity drop off as a function of distance from say like a threading dislocation. So this is a gallium nitride sample with several threading dislocations in it. Uh, but it turns out that the threading dislocation as depicted here in a cubic uh, crystal, um, it's not in and of itself uh, going to give you the diffusion length by just looking at the intensity fall off as a function of position. And as it turns out, uh, one needs to look at spectroscopic information to do that. So we're going to move into wavelength resolved or wavelength filtered CL and look at data analysis for uh, those sorts of information. 
So wavelength filtered or wavelength resolved CL comes from, again, stimulation at the sample surface from an electron beam, and then taking that light and feeding it into a spectrograph. Uh, the output looks something like this, where we have a spectrum. Its intensity is a function of wavelength. The interior of the spectrograph is schematically something like this. And basically, the camera, uh, there's a CCD camera at the end of the beam path after the diffraction grating, where the light is focused from the sample surface onto the CCD. So that allows us to capture an entire spectrum in one snapshot. So the camera is taking spectrum after spectrum after spectrum. So that gives us the capacity to collect point spectra, where we point the beam at a single point and feed the light again through the spectrograph onto the camera surface and say, we can see intensity as a function of wavelength for this sample, uh, for this position. However, um, it's possible to raster that beam and acquire a spectrum for every point in the image. We call those spectrum images. And there are two methods that we can use to gather them. Uh, one is called wavelength resolved, wherein we acquire for each position an entire spectrum. So we feed you know, position X1, Y1 to the camera, get a spectrum, and then uh, serially deal with space that way. For wavelength filtered, it's just the opposite. In this case, we use the spectrograph or the spectrometer as a moniker meter and feed uh, images of a single wavelength to a point detector, so like a PMT. And then we would process in wavelength. So you would serially acquire wavelength in the wavelength filter. So a spectrum image, again, is a spectrum, or it's an image that has a spectrum for every pixel uh, in the image. So this is an SEM image of a hex pillar that we introduced in uh, episode two and the corresponding spectrum image. So in the spectrum image, this has been integrated over all wavelengths that we acquired. There's not a lot of information that you can gather there except for that uh, we're stimulating the quantum well at the outer edge and we're seeing a high emission from that. Um, from the spectrum image, we can pull out a few spectra and just look at them. This is giving a little bit more information to the viewer. So you can see at point one, we're getting this ratio of peaks, uh, point two and point three. So you can see these different points with the spectral look load. So something that's useful to do visually um, for, uh, for ease of use is to go through the spectrum image and maybe highlight uh, a certain bandwidth so you can see features that you might not otherwise see. So in this fully integrated image, you just see this outer edge, but in the gallium nitride band image, so we've integrated from 355 to 370. And you can see there's a little bit different of a feature here than you find in the fully integrated spectrum image or the other two. So there's the in-game band and then the defect band around 560. This also gives us an opportunity to perform compositional mapping. So compositional mapping is when we look at the sample and we, we collect spectra for every point in the spectrum image and then map backwards from band gap to find what is the indium content across that sample surface. So from this publication uh, that's noted at the bottom of the slide, uh, we acquired this formula for determining what is the indium content as a function of band gap. So, Essentially, if we can determine what is the band gap across the sample surface, we can find what is the value of x. So this is a quadratic formula, and we can use nonlinear least square fittings to perform uh, a fitting across the sample surface to map out where is a peak for the in-gan band, since it's um, not always in the same position. So now I'm going to take you over to my digital micrograph interface, where uh, we're going to watch as I uh, begin to perform that, that nonlinear least square fitting. So right here, this is a survey image. So this is just an SEM image uh, that shows where the data is gathered from. 
So the, the green square, for instance, tells us where the spectrum image was gathered. And so there's a raster inside there, and then we acquire at the same time an SEM image and a CL spectrum image. So then for every point in the spectrum image, we can come and display a spectrum. So we can freely move that picker tool around and see the spectrum for every position fluidly. You can also slide around uh, what we call the slice tool, which is basically integrating a bandwidth of wavelength. Um, so you can scan across and see maybe there's some area of interest in your specimen that you want to take a look at spectrally. In this case, those are just gamma rays uh, that struck the detector during acquisition. So there's nothing really of interest at those points. But we can scan through and make sure that we're getting to, we're seeing what we want to see. Now, because this sample is um, a semiconductor material, we want to convert to electron volt basis because the energy uh, of emission is always going to be Gaussian around energy, not wavelength. So we transform it to the energy basis, move the same picker tool over to the, uh, the energy image. And now I'm going to set up nonlinearly square fitting uh, regions, and I'll throw some Gaussian fits at those regions. So again, one at the defect band, one at the in-gain band, and then one at the gallium nitride band. And so we'll just scan across the surface and make sure that the, the fitting tool is doing a good job at every, every point that's um, kind of of interest. It looks pretty good. So now I'd like to rename these Gaussians so that in the output image, I know which Gaussian is referring to which band. So the first one is the defect band, the second is the in-gan band, and then the gallium nitride band is last. All right, once those are set up, we just click map. There's some options here, but basically we're just gonna display everything. All right, and the output is three parameters for each Gaussian, including the amplitude, the full width half maximum, and the position. All right, now that that's all fitted up. So the, <clears throat> the parameter of interest in our case is the position of the in-gan peak. So it's this blue image here. So we'll rescale it. Go ahead and blow it up so we can see it. So there's definitely some information here. Uh, we can show an intensity scale bar, so you can get an idea of where that central emission is coming from. So the Gaussian is centered around those energies. So we're going to move it to a new workspace so that it's not as cluttery. Now that we're over here in a new workspace, I've already written out the solution to the quadratic function from that paper and then put some of the parameters that they suggest for mapping the band gap. This is a very simple script. It doesn't do anything except for uh, simple math to the values in an image. We just have to readdress the image. This is AH, so we'll go ahead and put in AH. And then run. And so this image describes to us the actual or estimates the indium content across the sample surface by using the band gap from nonlinearly squared fitting. So since displaying data is almost as important as analyzing data, one of the things you'll probably want to do is change the colors of this image or maybe the scale of it. So we'll go into uh, the menu here. and change the color scale to something with a bit more contrast than grayscale. And so that's how you can, using research data and nonlinearly square fitting, uh, determine or estimate what is the indium concentration for NGAN, but it's generalizable 
to other materials as well. As long as they've been investigated and you have information about the band gap versus concentration a priori. And so then we can add that image to our army of images um, having to do with that sample. Okay. So that tells us uh, about the indium concentration in the sample, but it doesn't really give us any information about what direction the light is going. Uh, so for that, we turn to angularly resolved CL or ARCL sometimes. Uh, so angle resolved CL is again, we have a, a parabolic collimating mirror sitting above the sample. The sample's at the focal point of that mirror. The electron beam strikes the sample. The light comes out, reflects off the mirror, and then it's projected onto an array detector, like a CCD. So since the CCD is acquiring information from a paraboloid, every point on the paraboloid that's projected into the space back onto the array detector corresponds to uh, a certain piece of angle space and each point is unique. So since each point on that detector is unique and maps back to angle space, we can transform into angle space. So what this image is telling me, the information that's here is from center, what the light intensity as a function of angle from the surface. So if normal is at the center of this image, and as we go right or left, we're going um, further and further away from the normal angle. So here's some angular scale bars to so get an idea of what we're looking at. Uh, the angular extent goes out into the 80s, something like 83 at the most extreme. I'm going to move the scale bars. So I won't typically display the scale bars, but uh, every image is basically having the same angle space. So uh, we collect uh, AR in much the way that we do uh, spectrum. So you can have uh, an emission pattern for angle resolve from a single point where you just point the beam at a single position and then you acquire an AR pattern or you can Require an AR spectrum image where there's an angular emission pattern for every point on the sample surface. So if we excite at this point, and then the next point, and the next. So we serialize space and we acquire an AR spectrum image for each point. So <clears throat> this is uh, an example of that where we've taken uh, a gold palladium nanostar and acquired uh, an AR spectrum image. So this is the SEM image on the left. In the middle is a fully integrated ARSI, so an angle resolved spectrum image. It displays all angles. And then this on the right is an AR, an angle resolved spectrum image with polarizers in place. So the red is highlighted along this polarization and the blue along the other polarization. So you can see already that there's a, a polarization effect coming from the sample, which makes sense because since it's a bit, a bit of metal uh, in the shape, uh, you would expect uh, dipole radiation to come out, and that would be polarized along its uh, or yeah, along its axis. And so, integrating around small space around the tips, we can look at the AR patterns from each of the tips. And so that's what we're seeing here. From each of the four points on the edge of the star, we're seeing different AR patterns. And I'll colorize them uh, so that it kind of makes sense. And then I'll add together the opposing corners. So I'll add together top left, bottom right, and bottom left, top right. To make these composite images that are really only displaying opposing corners, AR patterns averaged together. Now, if I take the difference of those two things, uh, what I can see is is kind of in in nearly equal amounts, uh, the radiation that's emitted from that nanostar is again proving to be dipolar. So this is just an example where we can take AR information and turn it directly into data. So what you're looking at here is is proof that we're uh, 
um, that that shape is emitting dipolar radiation in a long reach directions. So now I'd like to turn my attention back to the pillar sample, which again is um, gone over in, in greater detail in episode two, where we see these wavelength and angle resolved CL patterns. So this is just a few excerpts. I'm not going to show the entire uh, video for it. But what you can see here is in angle result or in wavelength and angle result, there's a bunch of additional information that one can gather in that you can see not only direction, but also there are these uh, quite evident patterns that are showing up. And so it may be of interest to analyze those patterns in a more meaningful way. And so um, I'm going to show now in my digital micrograph interface uh, the analysis of a different pillar sample where we're going to map back to the energy momentum space. So this is the SEM of a different pillar sample with much, much tighter spacing and smaller pillars. This is the corresponding unfiltered CL image. This is the raw wavelength angular CL data, where you can definitely see there's some pattern that's present. This is after transform, this is the polar map, we call it. So as I scan through wavelength, you can see the pattern kind of changes. Uh, and that's based on, again, the shape of the pillars and the spacing. So I'm going to first normalize the polar map. So this is the same data, but it's normalized by wavelength. So every wavelength image is normalized to itself. And so you can scan through here and see that the data is still preserved. It still makes the same shapes. And so now I'm going to remap using a script function into energy momentum basis. So because the sample is periodic and um, has a, a well-defined crystal structure, uh, basically we expect there to be photonic modes. So there'll be directions where certain wavelengths are disallowed and others are enhanced is uh, a real succinct way of putting it. So now that mapping is complete, and basically we're looking at a certain angle. So we're looking at all of the directions that come out along a certain angle on the sample surface. So what I'm scaling through right now is you can think of as a rotational angle going around the normal. There are some captions on there. All right, and that's for a different sample. Um, we can go back to the sample from episode two, which has this really pretty pattern data. And I've already remapped that one. And as you can see, there's a tremendous amount of information here. So this is particularly interesting whenever one has a, like a 2D crystal sample or a metamaterial that has some photonic or plasmonic behavior. You can immediately map uh, the energy and momentum after acquiring the wavelength angular CL data. So we go from wavelength angular, which reveals directionality uh, of light emission by color, and then we can map that into an energy momentum uh, mapping which reveals the photonic and plasmonic modes that are present in the sample. Now, a lot of uh, what you've seen here today was done using digital micrograph scripting, which is uh, an extremely useful tool that's uh, native to digital micrograph, or GMS. Um, 
The resources for digital micrograph scripting can be found in the help menu uh, in the program itself. Um, scripting has been made uh, such that digital micrograph can interpret Python language as well. So for those of you that are familiar with the Python language, you can readily integrate that into uh, digital micrograph. Uh, also, there are many script examples that you can find on our website at skitan.com slash resources slash scripts. Um, I highly recommend if you're interested in scripting and you want to get a handle on it to visit this website. There's a lot of useful examples there. All right, so we've gone over uh, different CL data and shown that it can reveal lots of interesting and important properties from your specimen, including like things like diffusion length, material composition, and uh, emission and anisotropy. Um, so data analysis methods uh, can include things like nonlinearly square fitting and digital micrograph scripting to do like simple math stuff or a quadratic formula, things like that. Uh, so it's a it's a great so data analysis is critical to understanding your specimen and digital micrograph can really be useful in helping you do that. Um, so at this point, I'd like to open up uh, the floor to questions. So please, if you have any questions, submit them uh, through the questions pane. All right, we're getting a few questions. All right, uh, so the first question is, in the nonlinear least square fitting, can you save a set of predefined functions? And the answer is uh, yes. So maybe I can take you over to my interface here and actually show you that. So in the nonlinear least square fitting, you can add any of the built-in functions, Gaussian, Lorentzian, um, Maxwell Boltzmann. There's, there's lots and lots of functions. You can define your own scripted functions as well. And then you can, for instance, if you like the way you've set up the boundaries and the behaviors of a simple or of a set of script functions, you can save them. So you can save that. And you can see I have a few built in here, gallium oxide and CIGS samples. So yes, you can absolutely save functions ahead of time. All right, the next question is, if I want to map the shift in a peak, am I limited by the system spectral resolution? Well, the answer to that is, is no. Um, no, the system spectral resolution is it's very good. It goes down to uh, something like tenth of a nanometer. And so the nonlinear least square fitting, because it uses an algorithm to fit across that data, will actually achieve, um, let's see, uh, it can de determine a shift in wavelength, uh, probably an order of magnitude better than that. So the spectral resolution is still going to be a limiting factor, but you can definitely overcome it uh, by and far. Okay. Uh, the next question is: Can one use multiple linear least square fitting or principal component analysis to decompose data? Uh, yes. Yes, and I'll take the next for that as well. So you can see. And there's an MLLS where you would need a library of defined functions. So you would need to have something defined already, but then you can also decompose into a principal component analysis and see what, uh, what components your sample is made of. All right, um, I think that's all the questions I'm going to field for now. Uh, so I'd just like to thank everyone again for attending. Uh, any of the remaining questions will be addressed offline. The recording will be available in five business days or less. Uh, it'll be posted on our website, and you'll receive a link to the video by email. Um, so if, if you have a topic that you'd like to see us cover, please submit that to us as well. 
or or looking for uh, something that you'd all be interested in seeing. Uh, the next webinar is tentatively planned for May 20, and the topic is to be determined. So thank you all again for attending, and have a nice day.